Well, I feel a little uh, insecure behind just this. You know, I can't hide behind the, the big pulpit this morning. But uh, we've got some special things going on for the service today uh, that you will see along the way. And I hope you've got a, a bulletin because there is a handout in that bulletin that you're going to need to look at a little bit later in the service. So if you didn't, you might at some point want to slip to one of the doors and grab one of those. Uh, but we do uh, welcome you, and we're glad that you're here. We're glad that you're here to worship with us at First Savannah this morning. Uh, if you're a guest, we would love to know that you're here. We'd love the opportunity to get to know you. Uh, there's a communication card there in the pew you could fill out, drop in one of the offering boxes. Um, or if you find somebody that uh, has one of these tags on, uh, they're walking all over the place, they would be glad to help you understand or know or find or anything that you need. Um, and so please look them up and we would love to have you stop us and ask for help. A few things just to let you know that are coming up. Uh, one is that the congregational meeting, our annual congregational meeting is coming up on the 21st of May, that's two Sundays from now, six o'clock here in the sanctuary. Uh, several things on that agenda. We elect elders and deacons, approve the annual budget, mission board members, hear some reports. There are written reports outside the doors uh, leading into the sanctuary and online. Uh, so we'd encourage you to grab one of those and take a look at that. Also the proposed budget for the next year is there. Uh, Vacation Bible School starts. The theme this year is discovering the meaning of life. That's June 5th through 9th from 9.30 to 12. That's for rising kindergartners through rising fifth graders. And so uh, the theme is treasure hunt. We're going to be searching for the meaning of life from pre-born babies uh, to eternal life. What does God's word tell us about that? How do we know about that? How do we understand that in light of the word of God, not in light of what culture may want to tell us today? Um, also, uh, the registration for that, by the way, closes in about a week and a half on May 17th. So go ahead and get your kids registered. Uh, over in the fellowship hall, today is the last day for you to help our student ministries get the funding that they need to go to the Student Life Summer Camp and also a missions trip to Romania this summer. There's a silent auction going on over there, lots of different items that you can bid on, uh, services that you can bid on, uh, some tasty treats, some art and craft things and uh, various things of that nature. So please head on over there after the service. The bidding closes at one o'clock today, so you may just want to hover around and make sure you keep bumping that up as you do. Let's worship the Lord together. We're so glad that you've come to do that with us today. Titus 2 says this, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ. The grace of God has appeared in Jesus Christ, training us to live for him. And as we live for him, we wait for another appearing, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So this morning, we're going to sing about his first coming, his dying and rising for us. And we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper, which we do so, proclaiming his death until he appears again. We're going to begin by singing a chorus in three languages like we did last week. Let's stand together. There's diversity and unity among the three persons of the Trinity, and God is calling people from every language and tribe to worship and to praise Him. We'll sing it first in English, and then we'll add the Spanish. We worship. We
and you were dead. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for the good works, which God prepared before him.
Let's take our seats. Brothers and sisters, let's bow our heads in the presence of our glorious King and Father. Day and night, they never stop saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they were created and have their being. Holy, holy, holy. Father, only twice in your sacred scripture is an attribute elevated to the third degree. When you revealed yourself first to your servant Isaiah and later to John, allowing them to see into the throne room of glory, there their eyes are captivated by your seraphim that are flying around the throne crying out with these words, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. You are just, you are love, you are wrath, you are mercy. Lord, you are a host of attributes that are both powerful, wonderful, and terrible to contemplate. Yet your holiness is what rings out in heaven and in all the earth, and it will do so forever. Attune our hearts, hearts this morning to yours, Father. May we today join with your angels and the saints gathered around your throne in joyful adoration. The author of Hebrew writes, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord, it is in that vein that we think about those who are struggling. David Starr, Matt Alfred, Susan Smith, Joanne Taylor, Joanne Carlisle. Father, your, servant and your, your servants and children. Father, who are in need of your, of your grace and your mercy and your love. We lift them up to you, Father. Father, we also, also lift up our global missionaries this week. Jerry and Glory Little, for the work that they continue to do, Father, in Ukraine. We give you praise for the successful effort in delivering medical aid. Father, for the impact of David's ministry in Chukasi. For the renewed opportunity to recruit medical and dental teams to serve in northern Iraq among the Bazidi people. Lord, we ask you also for favor as they return to Iraq. Bless that effort, Father. We lift up Gloria as she thanks of her father in the final moments as she goes to see him. Father, for opportunities to continue to, be, to share your name and your love with their granddaughters and their families. Father, we think of Refugee Empowerment Program and the work that they continue to do. Father, we ask for your blessing on them. We ask for your protection for them. God, would you continue to lift up us, your servants, and that ministry to be a part of what you were doing, Father, to bring hope to those that are fleeing war-torn and ravaged countries. Lord, I lift up Israel to you today. And Joel, you said, blow the trumpet in Zion, sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand. Father, today around the world, over a million people will begin in a 21-day fast asking for your blessing. Father, you have so told us when we bless Israel, God will bless us. When we curse Israel, Father, you will curse us. May we as a church, Father, be part of your, Father, your command, part of pleading and looking forward to the day of your return. And we know that that will not happen until your, your promises to Israel are made complete. Father, Isaiah 62, you said, I have posted watchmen on your walls, Jerusalem. They will never be silent day or night. You who call on the Lord, give yourselves no rest. And in the same vein, you said to, to us to not allow you to rest, Lord, until you establish your return in Jerusalem. And make her praise, make her the praise of all the earth. 
Lord, we cry out for the sake of your name and your people that Israel would humble itself and return to you. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Father, it feels like we are living in disastrous times, but you have told us, Father, to fast and pray and look forward to your return. And we do so, Father, for your nation Israel and for our own nation. Holy, 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 Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the name of the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Lord, we cry again, Maranatha. So what would you think if someone discovered a cure for cancer? We would be celebrating, would we not? All you have to do is this, and you will be forever cured. I am sorry to report that everyone in this room has a congenital condition that is far more serious than cancer. Oh, but I have some great news, but there is a cure. Here's the passage. Here's one of many that tells us this. This is 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. And do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Listen to this. Such were some of you. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. Jesus and the Holy Spirit can unlock the door to personal transformation. It's possible for those who walk through that door to become different from their former labels. There is a cure for idolaters, adulterers, homosexuals, thieves, covetous, drunkards, swindlers, revilers. God provides a will, which is the desire to become a different person, and the strength to be able to become a new person. When we partake of communion, the cup is actually designed to remind us of this incredible cure and truth. Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood. What's the new covenant? The Old Testament tells us it's him giving us a new heart because this congenital condition we have is a heart condition, not a physical heart condition, but a spiritual heart condition. And so when we partake of this cup, what we're doing is we're celebrating the fact that in Jesus Christ there is a cure for broken hearts, for evil hearts, for sinful hearts. We're celebrating something amazing that Jesus has done for us.
Jesus said, this is my body, which is for you. Let's partake together. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, and as a reminder, this is a symbol of the fact that he has the cure for a sinful heart. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let us partake together. My sin is nailed to the cross. My soul is healed by the scars. The weight of guilt I bear no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord.
Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5 and 11 through 15. But as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind, and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. This is God's word. When we partake of the cup, we were celebrating the fact that Jesus has provided the cure for broken, sinful hearts. He's made it possible for us to become transformed. But it's not automatic and it's not immediate. We have a part to play. And so three weeks ago, we talked about how does transformation work? What are, what are we supposed to do? And there are four resources that God has provided by which we can be transformed into new people in Christ. Uh, Prayer, study of God's word, uh, the conversion of trial into transformation. In other words, God tailors the circumstances to bring out the best in us. We just need to respond in the right way. And then number four, tap into the transformative power of Christ's community. And I want to remind you of a few things we said about that in uh, three weeks ago. So in Hebrews 10, 24, and 25, we're introduced to something called the uh, transformation protocol or the one another protocol. He says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. That passage is saying that we can actually be a transformative resource to one another, but it needs to happen in a certain way. So let's pick apart some of the pieces in that passage that tell us what that looks like. He says the goal is to help one another to love well and to do good. So our goal is for every person in the room to love well and do good. How does that happen? Well, we all need stimulation. He says to stimulate or stir up one another That's about urging one another on. Can I just do that just casually, off the cuff? No. He says, consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. In other words, I need to think about what is the best way that I can help someone to be able to become more like Christ. Notice the target group. It's one another. I can't encourage me. I can encourage you, and you can encourage me. But it's something where you can't self-encourage. It's something that needs to be ministered to someone else. Now, if you isolate, you're not going to be able to do this. Apparently, not forsaking our own assembling together is is the habit of some. There were some who decided, you know what? Gathering together with the saints, uh, I feel like I can kind of go it on my own. You're not going to be able to stimulate one another to love and good deeds in isolation. Gathering with brothers and sisters is critical. Going solo hobbles transformation. Now, gathered encouragement fuels someone's motivation to do what is right. When brothers and sisters in Christ gather together, they can be difference makers in the lives of one another. It is possible for you in this room to be a difference maker in the life of someone else. Uh, Passive gathering is a missed opportunity. Oh, we came to church. I didn't talk to anybody. Nobody talked to me and I left. That's a bust, according to Hebrews 10. 
When you come to church, you need to be asking two questions. Who can I give a word of encouragement to help them love well and do good? And who might have a word of encouragement for me? If that's not happening before the service and after the service, we've wasted the service. <laughs> because we're supposed to consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking or assembling, but encouraging one another. Where mutual encouragement fills the air, God's people are going to love well and do good. Now, two weeks ago, we talked about shepherds, elder, overseer, pastor, slash shepherd. Those are all different titles for the same person. And God requires men who demonstrate clearly 26 qualities for such a role. And we actually gave you a handout that you can use as we're getting ready to recognize elders, but it's something you can hang on to because when it comes around to time to recognize pastor next, that's God's profile. These are the things we should be looking for in this man. It says in Titus 1.9, this is describing these shepherds slash elders slash overseers, they are holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. These men are devoted to the word and that devotion fuels an ability to parakaleo, to actually encourage the flock. That's the same word that's used in the Hebrews 10 passage. We come together to encourage one another. And pastors who are devoted to the word and elders who are devoted to the word are able to encourage one another as well. So basically what we said is rub shoulders with a man who has those 26 qualifications and you will receive a boost in your transformation journey. Then last week we considered a second group who are described by the word diakonos or deacon, servant, or minister. Those are the three ways that that word is translated in the 70 or so passages where it shows up in the Bible. These are men who serve Christ by serving his people. And a man who is going to be a difference maker in that role possesses 11 qualities that engender trust. You say, I trust this man and therefore I'm willing to receive what he wants to give me. Let such a man engage with you and he will selflessly promote your true good. The apostles in Acts 6 actually identified two ministry priorities. They talked about service of the word and serving of tables. And that's similar to what elders and deacons do. The elders minister word-driven as shepherds and the deacons provide ministry support. The scripture also identifies two groups of women who are similarly engaged as mentors and servants to women. And so I didn't want to just do a series on all the things the men are supposed to be and leave out the women. So that's what we're going to do this morning is talk about some similar things that God says, this is what I'm looking for in women who are going to be difference makers in the lives of others. So first we're going to look at a particular group of women who are associated with service. I told you last week I'm going to save 1 Timothy 3.11. That's the passage that talks about deacons. But verse 11 is focusing in on women. And I would talk about that this week. So let's look at that. It says in 1 Timothy 3.11, women must likewise be, and then there's four things, dignified, not malicious gossips, but temperate, faithful in all things. Now this set of qualifications pertains to women. And it complements the list that was given to the men diakonos in the previous verses and the, to the follow. This list has uh, two things that they need to be. For example, dignified. That's the same quality that's used of the men in verse 8. And there is women who are going to make a difference as servants in the lives of others would be someone you look up to and respect. Number two, they're not malicious gossips, which is also used of older women in Titus 2 that we're going to look at in a little bit. The word translated malicious gossips is translated that way twice of women, this passage, and in Titus 2. Once of men in the last days, in the last days men will be malicious gossips. And otherwise, you know, 60 plus times, 
that word, which is diabolos, is used as a title for Satan. Ouch. <laughs> uh, th 34 times it's used as a title for Satan. And then three for, uh, two for women, one for men. This is sobering. A woman can, like Satan, speak ill of others to damage their reputation or work their harm. And he's saying, you do not need such a woman uh, as a difference maker serving others. Temperate, same word that's used of elders. Uh, elders are to be temperate, which means sober-minded and sensible, not rash and reactionary. The kind of people where uh, sound thinking prevails. And then number four, faithful in all things, meaning trustworthy, reliable. No matter what she's facing, you can count on her. She'll come through. Now, there are two views as regards these women. Uh, they are either the wives of deacons, and by the way, if you have an English Standard Version, it takes that view because it says they're wives, so it, it's actually saying they're kind of revealing what view they take. And if these are qualifications for deacons' wives, then you need to make sure that the men you recognize as deacons also have wives who meet these four criteria. Second view, it is also possible that this list is describing women who engage in service even as men engage in service. Uh, now, the word that the ESV has translated wives is the word gune. And the word gune just is translated woman or women. There is no Greek word wives. Uh, there's, neither is there a, a Greek word husbands. Uh, if you wanted to indicate that someone was a wife, you would use a possessive pronoun, his woman. And that's not here in that passage. It doesn't say uh, their women or his woman. It just says woman, women. Simply the word woman. And there's no separate word for wife that's being used. So if gune is translated wife, a possessive pronoun would be needed. Your woman. But that's not found here. The word likewise is used to introduce different classes of church servants, ministers. It says elders, and this is in the Timothy passage, elders must be likewise deacons, likewise women. So it's possible that this is referring to women who serve. Uh, whichever view you take, either wives as uh, women who are wives of deacons or women who serve, the bottom line is this passage is saying character matters. We need women who demonstrate the kind of character that makes them the kind of servants you would want to receive from. Look for women who demonstrate this kind of character, get together with them, and allow them to help you become a better servant of Jesus. That's what you're supposed to look for. There's also a second group. This group is found in Titus 2, 3 through 5. And we're introduced to another group of women who are mentoring specialists. Their core activity is teaching, and it's a didaskalos, but it, it has the word good in front of it, good teaching, kaladidaskalos. It's similar to something elders do, but it is directed expressly toward younger women. So here's the passage. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. So let's take a, a kind of a... 10,000 foot overview of this passage and what I'm going to do is just give you an overview Rochelle has taken a year or more to work through this content with younger women in discipleship groups and then has taken many years after that to walk them through the different stages of life we're not going to be able to do all that all we're going to do this morning is just get our bearings and get an overview a core definition for first four qualifications for the older women and then seven qualifications that relate to the younger women. And basically these are mentoring goals for older women with respect 
to themselves and to younger women. This passage, interestingly, is found in a section where Titus is being directed by Paul. So Paul wrote this letter to Titus. And he says, I need you to address some key issues relevant to certain age and gender groups. So he, addressed, he says to Titus, Titus, here's what you need to teach older men. Here's what you need to teach older women. Here's what younger women need to learn. Here's what younger men need to be taught. And here's what bond slaves, which would be contracted labor, what they need to learn. Paul directs Titus to give the instruction to each of these groups and help them with one exception. The older women are the right ones to mentor the younger women, not Titus. He says, Titus, do this, do this, do this. But he says, teach the older women to do this. And so this is something that older women do with the younger women, not Titus. Older women mentoring younger women, this is vital to church health. So Paul calls for the older women to for focus on four qualities. Now, two of them are virtues, which means be like this, and two of them are vices, which are, I like to think of them as age traps. As you get older, you've got to avoid this. Don't, don't go down this path. So let's take a look at each of those. Now, doing these things for older women is going to allow the older women to invest in the lives of younger women and have profound impact on them. The absence of these qualities is going to make it to where they're not really qualified to invest in younger women. All right, let's look at the four. They are to be reverent in their behavior, which means women whose devotion to God is evident in how they live. If you were to follow them around, you would say, it's obvious that you're not living for yourself. You're living for God. Everything you do is an expression of your devotion and service to the Lord. Quality number two, this is a vice. Don't, don't do this. This is the same one that is used of women servants or wives of servants, not malicious gossips. These are women who do not speak ill of others or damage their reputation or work their harm. You don't want older women who are prone to go diabolos. That will not be helpful to younger women because the younger woman is going to think, if I talk to this person, it's going to come back and bite me. Number three, they're not enslaved to much wine, which means they're not dependent on an external influence that diminishes the influence of the spirit. Now, for them... Wine was the primary mode in which you could kind of check out. I suspect that if Paul was writing the letter to Titus today, he would say, don't be addicted to wine and Facebook and getting likes and all the bazillion things would go in there. Now, again, I'm just speculating here. That's not scripture. But he's definitely saying you do not need women who are going to influence other women who are dependent on some external influence that's going to diminish their ability to be clear and hear well and then minister truth well. And then here's the fourth one. This is a positive. So we've had so far one positive, dignified, two negatives, and now here's the final positive. Teaching what is good. These need to be women who are capable of communicating what is right, what is healthy. A mentor who is capable of instructing younger women in what is good and right. That's what we're looking for in older women who are going to impact younger women. Now, as it pertains to these younger women, the teaching of what is good is actually explicitly identified in the seven virtues that follow in verses 4 and 5. So the older women need to be these four things in order to teach the younger women these seven things. But the implication is they need to be masters of these seven things. They have an example as younger women of having done these things and can therefore teach what is good to the youngers when they're older, not just by saying, here's what you need to do, but here, let me tell you how I did this. Let me tell you what I did. Now, there's nothing, oh, I need to say one other thing. I realize this is kind of dad humor, but so the younger women are responsible for seven things. 
The older women are responsible for four plus seven, which is 11, which makes them 711 women, which makes sense to me because 711 got their name because they started at 7 a.m. and they were open till 11 p.m. Well, that seems like what women are being asked to do is to be 711 women. So anyway, that's my term for it. Uh, Christy, wherever you are, you don't have to use that, but if you do, I'll be entertained. <laughs> there is nothing in the text that limits this ministry exclusively to the home. As any location where younger women are free and undistracted to learn from older women is perfectly suitable. Now, there's nothing in the text that insists this has to be one-on-one. -on -one. Now, everybody uses 2 Timothy 2.2 2 to say, well, one-on-one -on -one is the only way to go. It's a way to go, but it's not the only way to go. Older women need to impart to the younger women the values and virtues of Titus 2, 4, and 5 using every available means. In the home, at a Starbucks, in a classroom, one-on-one, -on -one, with a small group, seminars, retreats, large conferences, figure out what works, and that'll be just fine. Now, verse 4 begins with a purpose clause. He says, older women, be these four things so that, and that's telling us, be these four is what gives you a basis to be able to invest in younger women to do these seven things. Older women are to encourage, and the word encourage there is actually literally cause to become wise. Older women, be these four things, Result, so that you can help the younger women to become wise on seven fronts. Help younger women to demonstrate seven characteristics of wisdom. What are they? One, to love their husbands. Now, when Rochelle and I got married, we loved each other, and we were husband and wife. We had the certificate to prove it. I don't know if it came a few days later or what it was, but we had that thing. But the rest of our lives has been about learning how to love well as husband and wife. And sometimes that's challenging. So older women mentor younger women, and one of the things you help them do is to learn how to be a consistent promoter of what is in your husband's best interest. That's what it means to be a lover of your husband. To love their children. A woman who is devoted to and pursuing the true good of her children. Number three, to be sensible. She orders her life in a way that allows her to accomplish what matters most. This is a tough one because there's so many things that are crying out for attention and yet to be sensible means help her be able to discern between what doesn't matter and what truly does matter and to pour her energies into that. That's going to include mature judgment and restraint. Number four is pure her affections, her aspirations, her interests, and her diversions are uplifting and edifying and noble. She's not engaged with things that actually are morally polluting. She's instead saying, I want to focus on the things that are pure, that are true, that are right. Workers at home. Now, this is not saying that you can't have a job outside the home, but it is saying that her energies are home-centered. She's actively engaged in what causes her household to flourish. That's one of the things that older women are to help younger women be able to do. Uh, the younger woman needs to learn how to be kind. I think this one follows worker at home because when you're trying to get all the stuff done, sometimes it's easy to be harsh. But she's a worker at home, but she doesn't allow the demands of that pursuit to give her an excuse to become harsh or abrasive or irritable. She's an incredible servant. Uh, number seven, being subject to their own husbands means choosing to find her purpose in God's calling upon her husband. What is, what is your husband, what is God asking him to do? You know, I'm so grateful that uh, year one in our marriage, uh, Rochelle and I were, uh, were helping with the youth group at our church, and I think I've mentioned this, and we listened to a speaker and he said, are you doing something that anybody can do? Or are you doing something that only a child of God can do? And I knew we need to pursue ministry. And Rochelle 
said, I'm in it, and I will do whatever it takes to help make that happen. That was being subject to your own husbands, choosing to find her purpose in fulfilling God's calling upon her husband. Uh, this woman chooses to invest herself, her time, her energy in the fulfillment of God's plan for her husband. She promotes his good. Now, <laughs> I realize that list, you're going, ah! You didn't say it. You were being uh, gracious in that. But that's a daunting list, isn't it? I mean, is this, is this even possible for older women to invest in younger women in a way that embodies this passage? I mean, is this even realistic that this, that this can happen? And my answer, my answer is yes. Watch this. Discipleship is more intentional, showing more what it is to be pointed toward Christ and being in prayer and in the Word together. And also, hopefully, you would be teaching that to someone else. One of the things that I knew that I needed more in my life was I needed to be more prayerful and I needed to really desire scripture on a daily basis in a way that wasn't just to check off a box, but was so that I could take it and be transformed by it and then share it with others. I just felt very strongly like the Lord was leading me to ask you, will you disciple me? And you very quickly just said, yeah, but what does that look like for you? And I appreciated that question because I'd taken the time to pray. And that was such an encouragement to see how the Lord provided that. And, and then you said, I want to take time to pray about it and to ask you to, to show me the word, to spend time in the word with me, but also for me to be able to say, I want to just hang out and get to know you and be more like you was hard but exciting and it was sweet to see how the Lord did that. It's also really fun to look back now that it was like 11 years ago. Yeah, and I think that's a great way to look at looking for someone is you're, you're involved with someone's life and you see them doing life and you think, oh, yeah, that's how I'd like to do life, even further down the road, you know, and that's a great way to find someone to disciple or even mentor you. Yeah, I agree. Tell me about what it looked like for you to start discipling. Yes, I was at a Young Life Leadership Conference and they said, get in someone's back pocket and see how they live life in the Lord. And so the Lord just pressed upon me, this person, to ask her to disciple me. And she was about 15 years older than me and I knew her from around and she was very ready to do that and very engaging and so she really did invite me into her home into her life and I was a volunteer with Young Life at the time and was discipling or spending time with high schoolers and I would pray and ask the Lord to give me someone every year who do you want me to spend time with well so that girl and I started kind of being under the same woman and she asked us to do a Bible study with her young children and so it just kept multiplying and it was really cool because she didn't just let us ride along and read the Bible together but she put things into action for us and it's been 40 years and I still keep up with her so you said you were nervous when you asked me to disciple you yeah. um, and I think probably a lot of people are nervous and even the word disciple sounds intimidating. So how would you encourage someone to invite someone into their life? Walk up to them and ask them, you know, I mean, hopefully I've been around them enough because I obviously know that there's something about them I admire and something I want to learn from them. But if not, you know, it was just introduce yourself and let them know, hi, I I've been praying about getting to know you more. Um, and so, I mean, I, I had five lunches with five different women. It is hard to know, like, why do I want to hang out with somebody? And especially if it's somebody who's still very much got a job and, you know, busy with kiddos at home. Um, you want to know what you are bringing to the table also mm -hmm. and knowing that it's also not just a one-way relationship that was a huge part for me too um you want to have that connection but you also want to you want to be in their life what impact has discipleship made on you as far as the church is concerned 
it has been an encouragement, especially as somebody with very little church involvement and background and coming becoming a believer late, later in life. And knowing that I had you, knowing that I had Brocky, knowing that I had Stacy, knowing that I had Jen, like there were so many different people. There's Amy, all of a sudden, I've now connected with more people at church, especially because I was vulnerable in my faith. I was vulnerable in what it looked like. I, I wanted to be all into church and be a part. I wanted to serve. I wanted to love. Um, but I was, I mean, it was terrifying. I mean, it, it was something that was, was so difficult, but also it was a great way for Jesus to come to life to me, but also it made me all that more eager to be 100% in, all in, ready to serve and show somebody else that when they walk through the doors. That was fun. Uh, so this is not just theoretical, this is real. Older women mentoring younger women to be transformed and that's what God wants us to do. Now I've got one last word I want to add to this, and I realize again that I'm giving you the 10,000 foot overview, but this is something that women need to dig in deeper. Older women need to be four things so that, and there's a so that that's in there, they can teach the younger women to be seven things, but there's another so that. Older women should be these four things so that they can teach the younger women to be seven things so that the word of God is honored. When women don't demonstrate the 11, the word of God is very easy to dismiss. But when older women demonstrate these qualities and teach younger women how to demonstrate these qualities, the word of God looks good. Our society's fallen apart. Our only hope is transformation driven by God's word. And when the world sees nothing remarkable, nothing that captures their attention by how we as followers of Jesus live, the word of God is something they can easily dismiss, and they are dismissing it. But when 7-Eleven women are on the scene, that's when the word shines bright. And people see something and they say, would you please explain how you're doing this? Now you have to ask the question, where does the power come for that beacon? You know, the word of God is being honored. It's blazing like a spotlight. What powers that? And that's why you jump to verse 11 through 14. It says this, for the grace of God has appeared Grace struck like lightning when Jesus died on the cross. And his grace has appeared, bringing salvation to all men. God's grace saves, but that's not all. It also says, instructing us, grace actually teaches us how to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. We're actually empowered to walk away from the way of the world. Furthermore, it instructs us to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus. Grace teaches us how to live the 7-Eleven way and how to keep looking up and saying, I can't wait for you to come, Jesus. It says, Christ Jesus gave himself up for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. Grace actually becomes an internal power source, grace in Jesus. It saves us, but it also energizes us with zeal to be and to do what pleases him. The 7-Eleven are not some pipe dream. Jesus says, you don't have to live the world's way. There's another way. And he has revealed grace that can empower you to become someone new in Christ. Before taking communion, we read the passage. He says, and such were some of you. 
Those terms described who you were, but they don't describe who you are, who you have become. This is what you are capable of becoming. Everything in these passages that we looked at, the four plus the seven plus the four for servant women, those are all things that you have the capacity to become in Jesus Christ because he revealed grace that saves and transforms. So what do you need to do? Well, before you leave today, you need to find somebody to encourage. And you need to find somebody who will encourage you. And if it doesn't work this Sunday, come prepared with something next Sunday because that's why we're here, to become a transformed people. Let's pray. Father, we don't want to waste your grace. You have made it possible for us to become new people. As it pertains to women that we've looked at this morning, it is possible for young women, older women, to become remarkable, incredible blazing light depictions of the value of your word. Father, would you make us that? Help us to become that. Help us to be faithful in using the resources, including the encouraging of one another. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm going to ask Christy Bicknell to come up. She is the director of our children's, of our uh, women's ministry. Sorry about that. And uh, I thought it would be great to put her on the spot and just say, okay, what did you get out of that sermon? So anyway, and how can we apply it? So anyway, uh, what would you say there is something that you really want, I hope you heard this. Mm -hmm. You really need to hear this. So what's something like that that you would throw in there? Well, I'm grateful to say I had some of the notes before we came up here today. But um, one of the things that I really think is most important, and, I, and you said it at the very beginning, mm -hmm. is that women discipling and mentoring women is vital to our church health. Now, when I was a kid, I heard a phrase that made me laugh the first time I saw it, or heard it. Um, and I don't know that I would laugh today, but it was, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. And I think in the same way, we can look at our spiritual life. True? That when our spiritual life is not healthy, it has an ongoing impact on others in our sphere as well. And so when we are healthy, when we're pursuing Christ, it has an impact on our families, on our neighbors, on our community, and yes, on our church as well. And so particularly as I was thinking about just this whole concept, mm -hmm. as I want our church to be, mm -hmm. as I want the church to be, so I need to be. And that is a, a deep pursuit of Christ. You said it many times, that transforms us. And that happens most effectively in relationships with other people, with women particularly that can dive deep into life with us and ask us the hard questions. But it requires that we're willing to submit to those relationships at the same time. Yeah. And that we're willing to hear and to, uh, and to, to act on the things that are revealed within those relationships. Is there a, uh, you know, I can look back at my life and I can say, for example, when Rochelle and I were first married, there was a couple, Jay and Linda mm -hmm. Letty, who invested in us and that was mm -hmm. profound in its impact. Mm -hmm. Who's, on, in what case has mm -hmm. someone invested in you where you've been on the receiving end and how did that make a difference? Right, so um, I go back to some friends um, in another city that I spent time with one-on-one. -on -one. They walked through some pretty significant um, times of life with me. And they both exposed, they told me some things in my life were like, Christy, that's not, that's not a normal emotional reaction to this situation. Let's dive into the, the spiritual side of this. And so it prompted years of, of just some spiritual healing, some healing, both emotionally, physically, um, spiritually, but it um, brought me to today and it has um, encouraged me in how I live and work and I hope um, in my job and position here at the same time, but also the wisdom of women to tell me before I was ever married, just how fragile marriage is. And I, I lived that with my own family and to hold it carefully. And so there's, we could talk for hours about the impact of other women. Sound, uh, sounds like a plan mm -hmm. for another time. True. So, <laughs> so uh, you know, there are women out here, some who are already engaged, but right. some who are saying, you know, in fact, I know this from my interviews with all the, the RISE folk, mm -hmm. that uh, there's a longing, there's a hunger mm -hmm. for uh, a mentoring relationship right. like this. So right. what are some specifics that 
people could engage yeah. with or, you know, what's, what's the plan? What, what can we do? Um, I think it starts first that we all have to acknowledge and agree that there's a need for these types of relationships because if we don't agree on that, then it, we're, we're starting from a different playing field. And so as women, I hope we can agree with that and say, yes, we have the need for these relationships that we intentionally enter in together. They look different than a casual lunch or coffee, and most of y'all know I like coffee, but there's a purpose behind them. And so let's build these relationships. You mentioned it. They can be one-on-one, -on -one, and that's the model that most of us are accustomed to is the one-on-one -on -one relationships, but they can be in small groups. And so use um, some of the opportunities that we have um, just already in the life of this church. Um, Stephanie said in our conversation earlier this week, she said before she knew the, any women to talk to, she just started making a list of attributes. And I would encourage you to do the same thing, just to make a list of attributes of who, who, what women embody um, the character and the life that you, that you want for yourself. And then over time, we can build those relationships together. And if you have questions to talk to me, to talk to other women that you know, that we can start making those personal connections as well. Great. So uh, talk to me about this card. What's this yes. about? Um, so this is, again, um, I won't read it to you, um, but it does list some, uh, some opportunities that we have this summer, uh, some ongoing opportunities that lead into the fall from um, just small groups, that we're just calling them meetups this summer, to um, stories of God's faithfulness. Please go to the website and read the descriptions of some of these things. I think you'll be encouraged and you'll want to get to know some of the women that will be speaking. Um, and then, of course, Heart to Heart starts this fall. Um, so again, just opportunities that already exist within the life of this church that we want to make sure that you're aware of, that we can use them intentionally um, to transform. So if there's a, a younger woman who's mm -hmm. here who's saying, I have a longing for what mm -hmm. you're describing. She can come to you, yes. anybody else, or come to you? Um, I'd say let's, let's start and just have a conversation. Same if you're an older woman and want to mentor as well. Um, I, there's, there's just a quick, easy checkbox on the website. I don't want us to have an application. Much of this is just about life and getting to know one another and learning um, who you are. Um, and, and we'll work on that just organically versus a checkbox. Super. Sounds good. Any, any last word you want to give us? That's it. That's good. All right. Thanks, okay, Christy. Thanks. All right. Look forward to seeing how God's going to work to help us become 7-Eleven women, right? Let's stand together. We all want to be more like Jesus. We want to grow in our discipleship to be like him. Let's close by singing, Be Thou My Vision, Be First in My Heart.
if you would like to be encouraged at the cross by having someone pray for you, come to the cross after the service. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Go in God's peace. Thank you.